the Harvard Graduate School of Education, working at the nexus of practice, policy, and research. Well, you know, it's funny to be in this space because I taught here for many years before things were reconfigured a little bit. So here's one last chance, one last chance to do something in it. Um, I appreciate the opportunity. It's an honor to be asked. It's a delight to be here, and I hope I can share some ideas about this theme, the teaching of thinking over the next uh, few minutes. Um, by the way, for those of you don't, who don't know, the occasion for this is my retirement from the faculty. But I'm not retiring from Harvard. Uh, Kathy, thank you very much. With your support, I have shifted to the role of what's called a research professor. And I'll be continuing an affiliation for a number of years, working on projects, working on writing, and so forth and so on. Well then, so thinking about what to touch on today, I thought this might be a good theme. 40 years of teaching thinking. Revolution, evolution, and what next? I choose this because not all, but much of my time and my colleagues' time here has gone to this theme of teaching thinking. But these words today do have a particular occasion, and here it is. Queen's University, Belfast, last June, the 15th International Conference on Thinking. As Howard mentioned, the first conference was in Fiji, in fact, in 1982. And the second conference uh, was right here in 1984 at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And others have been in different parts of the world, including, for instance, Kuala Lumpur and uh, the uh, eastern coast of Australia and Hawaii and Puerto Rico. In fact, if you look at the list, there's a suspicious tropical <laughs> tendency. <laughs> but be that as it may, Queen's University, Belfast, it's kind of known that uh, I've been to all of these events. And in fact, somebody came up to me uh, during the Belfast conference and asked, Dave, as somebody who's been to all of these Tell me about how things have changed. And I had to say, I haven't thought about it. And I really hadn't. But it was a good question. And so I mumbled some general observations. And since then, began to think about it more. And when Kathy was good enough to ask me to speak to you today, uh, after some sorting out, I thought, that might make a good theme to discuss. So here we are, 40 years of teaching thinking. Now, just to be clear, I'm going to say a few things about what me and my colleagues have contributed. But mostly, this is a stand back perspective on the field, on what's happened in these last 40 years, on where the current movement to teach thinking started and where it's come to. And inevitably, as with any broad stroke, or for that matter, narrow stroke historical perspective. It is a perspective. It's how things seem to me. And caveat emptor, therefore, I'm sure somebody else would tell the story in a different way. I felt the need for some kind of motif. So I've chose Back to the Future. Back to the Future, the time travel film that involves time paradoxes and all sorts of twisty events uh, featuring Michael J. Fox and Christopher Lloyd as the mad scientist. I prefer you think of me as Fox and not the <laughs> mad scientist, but <laughs> I didn't bring my guitar though. So, How many people have seen Back to the Future? Wonderful. Okay, well you get the idea and Here's a little menu that I thought we might talk through. Back to the beginning, backing was lacking. Back to the present and what we learned. Back to the skeptics, because believe me, there were skeptics and still are. And finally, back to the future, the look ahead promised in the title. What next? And let's get started on it all. Here we go back to the beginning. Here's a little story. <laughs> the cultivation of thinking is ancient. 
But something new began to happen in the 70s about thinking as a cognitive process. Let's call it the GPS model. Now, I'm going to expand on that a little bit. The cultivation of thinking is ancient. Oh, it is. Not only we, uh, not are we Homo sapiens sapiens, but uh, most notably, the Greek rhetoricians are very concerned about how to structure thought effectively. Aristotle formulated the syllogisms, the various logical forms that underlie uh, deductive reasoning. Jumping forward 1,500 years, or no, more than that, a couple of thousand years, actually, we have Francis Bacon, who formulated the beginnings of our conception of the scientific method in reaction to the scholasticism that had dominated the medieval era, saying that it's not enough just to review what Aristotle said, for instance, and demonstrate points by reference to Aristotle. We need to look at the world. We need to examine how the world behaves, and so on and so forth. The notion that there are ways by which one can guide one's mind toward more insight, toward more invention, toward deeper truths, that notion is an old one. But something new began to happen in the 70s, and Howard already alluded to it. What happened, basically, was the cognitive revolution. In fact, it was already happening already happening in response to B.F. Skinner and the behaviorists, already happening through very smart, insightful figures like Jerome Bruner. The notion was that, contrary to the behaviorist creed, we have minds, and we do things with our minds. And one of the things that we do with our minds is to think. So let's think about thinking, about thinking as a cognitive process. And just to give a kind of viewpoint of that time a name, let's call it the GPS model. And I'm going to spend a minute sharing some thoughts about the GPS model. Where do I get this? Well, GPS stands for General Problem Solver. And the notable source here is the work of Alan Newell and Herbert Simon, particularly their 1970 Two book called Human Problem Solving. <clears throat> Newell and Simon and others of their era tackled the biggie of what is it to think? What is going on when people think? And they proposed that thinking can be modeled as search in a problem space. So we have a problem. Maybe it's a problem on a chessboard, and the space is the space of possible moves. Or maybe it's a decision you have to face. And the space is the space of possibilities. If I do this, then that might happen, but I can do this instead, and so forth and so on. And they wrote a computer program called the GPS, the General Problem Solver, to run simulations that they thought would parallel the way people actually thought about such things. They used formal problems, problems of mathematical proof, for example, and certain kinds of puzzle problems. And they took think aloud protocols from human problem solvers, and they were actually able to show that their program did things parallel to the sorts of things that people did in tackling such uh, challenges. Their conclusion was that in a certain sense, Human thought is very simple. It's dominated by the shape of the problem space, by the sorts of affordances, the pathways forward, and the blockades in the way, and by a repertoire of tricks, of strategies, such as don't start at the beginning, start at the end, and reason backward from the goal you want to get to, and a number of others. These were called heuristics, and they were very general broad, and perhaps powerful ways of thinking. Another key figure of the time was the mathematician George Paglia, 1887 to 1985. Well, Paglia did mathematics too, but interestingly, he thought about mathematics. He paid attention to the way mathematicians thought through problems. He argued, as did many others, that effective problem solving was a matter of the use of a number of heuristics, 
tricks of the trade, strategies, and famously wrote this book, How to Solve It, a new aspect of mathematical method. You see, thinking about mathematical method has focused on the challenge of proof. What is a proof? What's a strong proof? What makes it correct? And so forth and so on. Not on how you come up with proofs in the first place. Paglia wanted to examine the practical art of coming up with proofs in the first place. Where did they come from? How did they get invented? Not just whether they were valid, but the construction process behind them. And Paglia identified quite a range of tricks of the trade, including, for instance, if you face a problem that's tough, why not try to solve first a simpler problem of the same sort? Or why not try to divide the problems, problem into parts? Uh, case one, case two. Maybe you can solve case one and also solve case two, and then you have the whole thing. And a number of others of that character his book, A New Aspect of Mathematical Method, How to Solve It, was a guide to that art and craft. And again, the ideas were very general. You don't have to be looking at a mathematical problem to say, maybe I can divide this problem into parts, or maybe I can solve a simpler version first and then tackle the big one. More generally, the big idea was, we might say, thinking organizers, ways of choreographing the course of thought. Here, for instance, we have a Venn diagram. That's a thinking organizer, a way of conceptualizing intersecting sets and seeing what items might have common properties. And in fact, <clears throat> thinking organizers are commonplace in our lives. Here are some familiar ones. Uh, dec decision making, very familiar idea. Uh, when you're making a decision, you want to think about options beyond the obvious options. And often people get into trouble in decision-making situations because they aren't imaginative enough about what the options really are. And you want to think about the long-term and short-term consequences and their importance, and so forth and so on. This is commonplace. And in fact, people just know and pick up these kinds of things. Years ago, I asked students in some of my courses to kind of fill out inventories of the problem-solving perspectives they use and the decision-making tricks they use. And everybody had a rich repertoire. One of my favorites was um, somebody who wrote, I talk it over with my cat. <laughs> now you think about that, and many people say, I talk it over with my friends and so forth, of course, but I talk it over with my cat. That's actually not a bad strategy because A, your cat listens. <laughs> And B, it gives you an occasion to articulate what you're struggling with. And the externalizing of the puzzle you face is a huge step in trying to sort it out. Or the idea of brainstorming. Uh, people often think of brainstorming as just getting a lot of crazy ideas, but actually there are a number of rules to it. Rules like bounce off the earlier items if you can. Rules like suspend criticism, and this helps to accumulate a rich array of possibilities. Or this notion of the structure of argument, which comes from the philosopher Stephen Tolman, reason warrant claim. The reasons are, if you like, the evidence or the facts you start from. The claim is what you're getting to, and the warrant is the generalization that bridges between them. And complicated argument consists of a whole tangle of reason warrant claim trios uh, that sort of nest together. And this can be used as a way of cultivating an analytical perspective on evidence and how one builds up evidence to make a particular case, and many, many more. Again, some of these were suggested by sophisticated people like Stephen Tolman. Others are just commonplace, and parents tell their kids about them, and people pick them up, and so forth and so on. But, but there was a very interesting series of observations from various people that went along with all this and that is that some people were much better at this sort of thing than others. And indeed, some people had much richer repertoires of these kinds of things than did others. Some people had rather ragged, thin, pale repertoires. So could it be that this is not only cognitively interesting, but perhaps 
an educational opportunity. Could it be that we can take these general problem-solving techniques and teach them? Let's teach people to organize their thinking better. So in the 60s and more in the 70s and gathering momentum, people were trying various ways to basically teach kids and sometimes adults to organize their thinking better using a variety of thinking organizers. Good idea. We were excited. We were involved. We were revolutionaries. We were going to change everything. But backing was lacking. Now, it wasn't so bad, at least not in the long term. Here's the story for this one. Eventually, teaching thinking worked, but not very well at first. And the movement ran into three formidably skeptical stances, IQ, situated learning, and back to basics. Well, I actually want to begin this section by talking a little bit about the evidence. And I'm not going to talk about it in great detail because it's not the main point, but I kind of wanted to, to get it out of the way. So the basic thrust of the matter here is that over the decades, a variety of evidence has accumulated that, yes, we can teach people to think better. There's not much question about it at this point, at least from my perspective, and uh, many people who pay attention to this sort of thing. And I'm going to fill that in a little bit, but briefly. For instance, <clears throat> my first substantive involvement in this area was a project called Project Intelligence. And it occurred here at Harvard University in 1978 to 1984. But really not on site. Uh, it was conducted at Bolt, Baranek, and Newman, a high-tech consulting firm uh, just west of us in Cambridge. Uh, now gone, but it was done on subcontract through Harvard University. And interestingly, its chief was the behaviorist uh, Richard Hernstein. Uh, in any case, he was the only behaviorist in the whole team. <laughs> and everybody else was very enthusiastic about the possibility of increasing intelligence. There were several units, foundations of reasoning, understanding language, verbal reasoning, problem solving, decision making, inventive thinking. Uh, my role was as developer of the inventive thinking unit. And other people were involved in the, uh, the others. It was very exciting. And we went to, oh, the strange thing about this was that it was done under contract with the nation of Venezuela, who was interested in wild scale educational reform on a number of fronts, hence these, uh, uh, Spanish titles, Proyecto de Inteligencia. Uh, and this is the Fundamentals of Reasoning Unit. This is the uh, Decision Making Unit, Toma de Decisiones. Uh, and it was really a fascinating enterprise, and it was developed over a number of years, and quite elaborate testing was done during a one year trial. Findings included increases in academic aptitude, modest but uh, statistically significant, uh, academic aptitude being more or less the same thing as IQ, dramatic gains in the target abilities on target abilities tests, uh, an open-ended design task, uh, which connected to the inventive thinking unit, showed dramatic increases in the sophistication of the designs the youngsters produced. This was targeted at the seventh grade level, by the way, although it could be used in any grade, two or three up and down, quite easily. And in an open-ending reasoning task, 25% more evidence. So there are various indices of uh, impact. One of my real regrets has been that we never had a chance to do follow-up work. Very interestingly, uh, at the end of the project, it also happened it was an election year, and the oil market had collapsed. And basically, the administration that had supported all this was swept out of office. <laughs> and the new administration was completely uninterested <laughs> in pursuing any of this. Not only uh, project intelligence, but there were some 10 or so other projects from different researchers and developers that 
that uh, were part of this basically national initiative. And virtually all of them uh, just stopped with the change in administration. A shame. I would love to know how those kids fared moving forward and what would have been the impact of some kind of continued intervention. That's a little bit about that, and that was really my baptism in serious work of this sort. But here's some other findings. Uh, positive findings we have in teaching mathematical problem solving, for instance, from Alan Schoenfeld, instrumental enrichment, a program from Reuven Feuerstein, the Israeli psychologist and educator, particularly directed at uh, people with learning difficulties. Philosophy for Children from Matthew Lippmann, Edward de Bono, whom Howard man mentioned, uh, the Cognitive Research Trust, or CORT program, which actually has been shown to have some impact, even though you might not think so from looking at it on certain measures. Robert Sternberg, the triarchic theory and of uh, intelligence and matching with learners' aptitude, and others, and the list could be longer. The basic point I want to make is by this time, there's lots of evidence on various measures of impact. Particularly interesting, I think, is the last one, cognitive acceleration through science education, called CASE, developed by Phil Philip Aidey, uh, a uh, Brit, and what's interesting about this is that he was able to do long-term follow-up work and found lasting impact in other subject matters two or three years after the administration of the program. This is sort of the gold standard of long-term FAR transfer. That is to say, long-term, two or three years later, FAR, that is to say, not just in science learning. It is a kind of a gold standard. And the trouble with this gold standard is nobody, uh, hardly anybody actually gets around to it because long-term work is difficult to get support for, and so forth and so on. But uh, here's one of the cases where there is evidence. So yes, it can be done. There's not much question about it at this point. So yes, teaching thinking worked. But not very well at first. There were some early evaluation efforts for various programs, and they didn't show very well. Initial efforts, for instance, to use Polyus heuristics to teach mathematical problem solving, well, the students just didn't get any better at mathematical problem solving. And others like that. In retrospect, probably the simplest reason for the difficulties with this was that the treatments were simply too short term. <laughs> they just didn't grab that much of the learner's time. But there were other factors too, and we'll get to those. In any case, in parallel with the development of these ideas on the part of various researchers were three formidably skeptical stances. And here they are, IQ, situated learning, and back to basics. And I'd like to say a word about those because they're very much part of the historical story here. Skeptical stance number one, IQ. On the left, we see Arthur Jensen and a very well-known book by him, Bias in Mental Testing, 1980. Arthur Jensen was very much of an IQ maven, believed that IQ was largely hereditary and largely unchangeable, and also argued that there were systematic racial differences in IQ that were uneliminable. Uh, he became notorious for this position. On the right, the bell curve, uh, 14 years later, by Richard Herrnstein and Charles Murray, also arguing much the same set of ideas about IQ, and arguing with Jensen that IQ was an enormously important determinant of how well people did in a variety of life roles. Also a very controversial book. Now neither book nor the general discussion in many ways about IQ deals very directly and extensively with the possibilities of teaching thinking. But both books comment on it a little bit. 
And in general, people interested in IQ and committed to the construct are very skeptical about the prospects of teaching thinking because they believe that thinking by and large is determined by your organic endowment, the horsepower of the engine under your skull. And horsepower is horsepower. <laughs> it's what makes the big difference. That, in maybe slightly caricature terms, is the stance. <clears throat> now, there were other targets to this position besides thinking skills, but thinking skills was one of them. And this would come up. What can you really do? Can you really make people smarter? What does it mean to make people smarter? Isn't it basically a matter of IQ? Now, of course, there have been many challenges to the IQ tradition. Right here, uh, Howard in the room with his theory of multiple intelligences, for example. Another would be Robert Sternberg with his triarchic theory of intelligence and many others. So at this time, this was not an unchallenged perspective at all. But in any case, these notions of teaching thinking were in the mix and in the fight. Let's look at another challenge. Very different challenge. Skeptical stance number two, situated learning. Here are two key sources. A book called Situated Learning by Jean Lave and Etienne Wenger, 1990. And from the 1989 educational researcher, a very well-known article, Situated Cognition in the Culture of Learning. John Silly Brown, Alan Collins, and Paul Duguid. And a wealth of other literature. What was this about? In broad stroke, in broad stroke, the idea was that we needed to look at learning in areas like math, science, history, and in professional areas like being an engineer or an auto mechanic in very concrete ways. These were situated undertakings with concrete physical settings and social structures around them. What happened in the typical math class in a high school had very little to do with the life of mathematicians or even junior mathematicians. Uh, what you might learn about automobile motors in some course in high school had very little to do with what it was like to be a mechanic with the equipment and the structure and the social structure around you and so forth. The big argument here was that education in general kind of had it wrong. Education in general and its typical conduct was too abstract, too detached from real contextualized practice. Real practice occurred in what was called communities of practice and in physical settings of real authentic work. Now, the advocates of situated learning were not particularly after thinking skills as a target, but thinking skills, among other things, fell within their gun sights as an example of one of these areas that was too abstract and detached from real practice. Some went so far as to argue that basically you can't have general thinking skills at all in any meaningful, powerful sense. Yeah, you might become better at mathematical thinking in a mathematical community or scientific thinking in a scientific community, in a community of physicists, but you can't really expect to improve thinking in any general way at all. Now, like IQ, the situated learning perspective was controversial, and there were voices speaking out against it right from the beginning. But nonetheless, there it was, and it became another reason why some people got skeptical about teaching thinking, another way, if you like, to keep teaching thinking out of some schools where it might otherwise have got a foothold. And finally, skeptical stance number three, back to basics. Well, it almost speaks for itself. The general idea is that we don't want this fancy progressive stuff in our schools. We want the kids to get really good at reading, writing, and arithmetic. And we want them to know a lot of information. And in some sympathy with this, as we all know in this room, there is this huge and persistent achievement gap 
which shows itself very clearly in very basic performances around, for instance, reading and writing and basic mathematics. It's stubborn, it's hard to get rid of, and many people have felt that that's where we should be putting our educational resources. And the typical critique of something like teaching thinking is that it's a distraction, it's too fancy. What the point? What's the point if the kids can't read? What's the point if the kids can't do basic arithmetic? Why get fancy about things? Now again, uh, teaching thinking was just one target of the back to basics <coughs> rhetoric. And in fact, the basic back to basics uh, position can be seen as a reaction to other things going on too, to progressive education, to inquiry oriented science and so forth, to uh, trends that might create a more liberal and skeptical society, which didn't sit well with some people. But in any case, this was a third counterforce. And all of these counterforces, I think, deserve some kind of a response. And I'll get to that in a minute. Anyhow, there's a bit about the problem of backing and the counterarguments as it looked at the time. So here we are. Eventually teaching thinking worked. And there are many different approaches, I should say, not just one. But not very well at first. And these three counter stances, IQ, situated learning, and back to basics. OK, then. Back to the present and what we have learned. Now, there are so many different ways of trying to sum this up. And I'm sure somebody else would come up with a different read on it all. But to me, these five items stand out. You may recall that our starting point was this very broad notion of general problem solving. The idea was that there were a repertoire of heuristics, strategies, quite general in character, applicable across a range of subject matters. And if only one could get these in one's head and trot them out appropriately, then one would be functioning in a much smarter way. That's the big initial idea. I think perhaps there are five things, at least, that we learned in the course of the years. And by we, I mean the field. To get explicit, to get a control tower, to get social, to get more situated, but not completely situated, and to get dispositional. And let me share some thoughts about each of those. For one thing, let's get explicit. Here's Paglia again with his ideas about heuristics. And here on the right is a kind of a worksheet done by students to follow through some of the Paglia processes. Now, over the years, uh, reading articles, talking with teachers from various disciplines, I've found and others have found that there's an interesting stance toward this use of explicit strategies, of explicit thinking organizers. Many teachers say, and some professors say, you don't want to get too explicit. You want to create a culture. You want to operate kind of by osmosis. You want to generate a thoughtful process of learning in which these good moves are embedded. And learners will kind of soak them up and go forth changed. Well, that's not what you see on this chart, this example. What you see here are items like alternative solution, looking for a different approach, generalization possible, and so forth. You see this problem solver tracking his process, <laughs> articulating it, and it turns out that that seems to be what's needed. In fact, I mentioned the work of Alan Schoenfeld earlier. Alan Schoenfeld uh, conducted systematic experiments where he contrasted teachers that modeled the mathematical problem-solving process, the sorts of things Paglia was doing, was recommending, but didn't label what they were doing with teachers who modeled and labeled 
See here, I'm dividing the problem into parts. Here, I'm taking a simpler problem that may help me solve the tough problem. And he found out something very interesting. When you're explicit about the process, problem solving improves dramatically. When you're not explicit about the process, it makes no difference whatsoever, even though you're enacting the process. The researchers Bereiter and Scardamalia conducted similar research. So we know something about this. We know that osmosis is not enough. We know that tacit modeling is not enough. We know that we need to get explicit. Number two, general problem solving gets a control tower. Another discovery, also handled by systematic treatment control experiments, was students needed to be taught to monitor what they were doing, to think about the overall choreography to think about where they were in the process. It wasn't enough just to have a repertoire of these heuristics, these strategies, these thinking organizers. You had to be thinking like a manager, a self-manager. When one just taught the heuristics, people didn't get better at their problem solving. When one taught the heuristics plus a tracking yourself and managing yourself strategy, people did another big fundamental learning. Of course, the official name for this sort of thing is metacognition. <laughs> but a certain kind of metacognition, a kind of real-time metacognition that tracks the overall process and redirects it. Number three. This is an easy one. General problem solving gets social. Many of the early interventions were not particularly social at all. You know, kids would sit there, the teacher would pose problems and suggest strategies, the kids would work the strategies at their desks and so forth and so on. But the whole thing became highly social for the most part. I, I imagine there are some out there someplace, but these days I don't know a single methodology that doesn't use a lot of group work, a lot of conversation, a lot of... Uh, shared work at the whiteboard, and so forth and so on. And this makes a lot of sense, actually, from a situated learning perspective as well, because it creates a kind of community of thinkers in the classroom. Number four, GPS gets more situated. This goes back to the critique from situated learning and the idea that we need richer, more authentic, social contexts of engagement. Let me say a few things about this. For one thing, approaches like those based on the work of Paglia are already situated in a particular discipline. Another approach is to pick an important target skill, like reading. This is a very well-known, uh, this is a sort of a uh, graphic version of a very well-known body of work on Reciprocal Reading, developed by Anne Brown and Anne Marie Palinsar, uh, they were able to show that youngsters who use systematic approaches to deep reading of discursive content could come out with a lot better understanding than otherwise. And interestingly, this was a very social approach. It involved different roles in small group work, like the clarifier, the questioner, the summarizer, the boss, and so forth. So students would work in small groups, facilitated by a teacher initially, and these roles would rotate around so they would get the feel for what it was to look at the text from the standpoint of the questioner or from the standpoint of the predictor. And uh, at least in the initial experimentation, uh, this proved quite effective. And there have been a number of other strategic reading approaches that also show some marked gains. Another very general way to get more situated is to design your thinking organizers so that they are normally deployed in the context of subject matter learning. This kind of a, a two, kind of two styles of doing this kind of thing. Uh, one style is to have a separate course. I mentioned earlier 
Project Intelligence. Project Intelligence was a separate course. It was taught during its own course period. The other way, generally called infusion, is to embed the use of thinking practices into the learning of content. But try to keep those thinking practices so that in principle they can be used in other disciplines, so that they're portable across disciplines. A lot of our own work here at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, here at Project Zero, has had this character. Uh, here's a very broad strategy that we've used over and over again in many classrooms. What's going on here? What do you see that makes you say that? It's a deliberately general question. It's quite a powerful question. And you could apply it, for instance, to a work of art. Or you could apply it to the Constitution of the United States. What's going on here? We. Why that big we? Or you could apply it to a wagon. Or you could apply it to Newton's F equal MA. And surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, it's remarkably easy to get students to engage this pair of questions. They are designed deliberately to be very non-threatening, you might notice. It's not that we're saying, what's your claim? And what evidence do you have to back that claim? We're saying, what's going on here? And what do you see that makes you say that? A much softer version, but basically this is an evidential discourse pattern. It's a way of fishing for a conclusion and evidence for the conclusion, a provisional conclusion, and can be used remarkably richly right across the subject matters, but is used typically in the context of subject matter learning. Here's another example. I used to think, now I think. This discourse pattern is a, another one widely used in our work and other people. Uh, here's some interesting samples. These are drawn from the work of my colleague Shari Tishman, who's sitting right there. Uh, and uh, these are reflective examples extracted from students after a number of weeks of working with this approach that we've developed called visible thinking. So for instance, a sixth grade student writes, I used to think art wasn't very complex or thoughtful. Now, I think art is very complex, and there are a lot of observations you can make, and that there are a lot of viewpoints in art, and it is really interesting and fun to look at. Well, it's nice to hear. Or the ninth grade student, I used to look at just the obvious meaning of the picture, or painting. I never thought deeply about it. Now I think, I look for the hidden messages or hidden figures inside of pictures or paintings. I think about what the creator wants to be received by the viewer. I think about how it relates to history or my life. That's pretty good. Now these little simple things, like I used to think, now I think, or what's going on here, uh, what do you see that makes you think that? There are dozens of these. Different teachers like different ones. Different teachers use them in different combinations. The real point here is the strategy of infusion, to have relatively simple strategies that map easily into particular disciplines and can be used across disciplines. Another important thread of this is to work with patterns of thinking that are particularly important in certain disciplines like probabilistic and statistical thinking, for example. Or in history, issues of original sources and the problems with original sources, which, for instance, may be biased. So that is a bit of the story about getting more situated. But you notice that this more situated is not so much situated that one is abandoning the idea of generality. One is still dealing with themes and strategies and perspectives that cut across the disciplines. And number five, GPS gets dispositional. The longest word in the talk. <laughs> dispositional, what does that mean? Well, <clears throat> what it means is, it stands in contrast 
with abilities. One question is, what can you do? What are you able to do if I ask you to do it? Another question is, what are you disposed to do? What do you lean toward? What do you embrace? And over the years, the notion has emerged that the dispositional side of thinking is tremendously important. A key classic figure here is John Dewey on the left, who wrote about habits of mind and the importance of cultivating habits of mind. It's not just that you can think about the other side of the case or that you can look for evidence. It's whether you're inclined to do so. On the right, some will recognize this figure as Israel Scheffler, a notable professor of education, a philosopher of education, uh, retired for a number of years, who wrote a beautiful essay many years ago called In Praise of the Cognitive Emotions. His target was the idea that thinking is somehow a detached from our emotional life. And he made a series of powerful points about the role of certain emotions in our cognitive life, like, for instance, curiosity, or like, for instance, surprise. Surprise, when we are surprised, is a signal to us that there's an anomaly. Maybe it's a good surprise, maybe it's not so good a surprise, but still, there's an anomaly that invites us in to try to figure it out. And in a number of other ways, pointed out the powerful role of certain emotions in our intellectual lives. Well, over these decades, there have been a number of other dispositional constructs. Here are some of them listed here. Mindfulness and mindlessness from Ellen Langer here at Harvard. Beliefs about intelligence from Carol Dweck, who discovered that Many youngsters harbor the notion that their intelligence is fixed and therefore effort is futile. <laughs> you either get it or you don't. So your stance toward intellectual difficulty is a kind of a quitter stance. Try a little bit and then quit. Whereas others have a different view that intelligence is sort of expandable. And if you hang in there and invest effort, you can make progress. Need for cognition from Cassiopo and Petty. Some people groove on cognitive complexity more than others. And we can encourage people to do so. Or need for cognitive closure from Arya Kruglansky. The idea that some people want to settle things quickly, whereas others are more willing to hang in and take a more deliberative approach. These sorts of measures profile not the abilities side, but the dispositional side of what it is to think well. And in general, these measures do not correlate or do not correlate very much with IQ. They're a characterological dimension, if you like, of what it is to be smart. I want to talk here about a, little, uh, a little bit about our own work at the Graduate School of Education and at uh, Project Zero. Uh, we've been very involved with the dispositional perspective, and we've sorted it out this way. If you imagine what it is in a real life situation to get intellectually engaged in something, maybe you're listening to a political speech, say. There you are, here's this fellow or lady on the TV talking about our nation, talking about its problems, talking about what's needed. Well, to really think, about what you're hearing. For one thing, you have to be alert. You have to detect moments where there's something you can affirm or something about which you might be skeptical. You have to be engaged. You have to follow through. You have to embrace the moment, not just detect it. You have to say to yourself, I care about that. I want to figure it out. And of course, you have to be able. You have to be able to do the thinking in question. So there's this little trio of requirements, being alert, engaged, and able to make the thinking happen well. This is very straightforward. It's a point of logic. Let me show you an example here. 
<clears throat> this is a newspaper article. It comes from the Boston Globe. 15% of Florida citrus crop lost to frost. Terrible thing. Frost killed 10% of the orange crop and 5% of the grapefruit crop in Florida orchards this year. The unusually cold weather hurt farmers already suffering from the current economic crisis and so forth. How many people see something puzzling in that? <laughs> Lois, what's puzzling in that? Help me out here. Give me a hand. Well, you got 200% and 10% and 5% isn't going to add up to 15. 10% of the orange crop and 5% of the grapefruit crop isn't going to add up to 15%? Well, and what about the lemons? And what about the lemon? <laughs> well, how many people saw a problem like that? Yeah, well, this is true. Percentages don't add up like that. I mean, if it were 10% of the orange crop and another 5% of the orange crop, one could talk about 15% of the orange crop. But 10% of the orange crop and 5% of the grapefruit crop, who knows what percentage that adds up to. It depends on how much of it all is oranges, how much of it all is grapefruits and whether there are lemons. <laughs> so one would like to have readers in this very simple, not very interesting context alert to things like that. Detecting things like that and saying that doesn't quite make sense and understanding enough about percentages to figure out that it doesn't quite make sense. The interesting question here is when we miss things like this, and we miss things like this all the time, when we miss things like that, to what do we attribute the problem? Psychology tends to be ability-centric in the way it profiles human performance. Many would tend to say, for a percentage problem like this, the problem is that the people don't understand percentages. If they only understand percentages, they would pick up on that right away. The problem is the ability end, not being alert and engaged. But probably everybody in the room understands the percentages. Not everybody quickly tuned into this point. And just think about that. You're reading this random article that talks about 10% and 5%. Are you going to be alert to that? Are you going to notice that's a problem? How many things like that do you read past without even noticing it? In fact, uh, my colleagues and I, including Shari Tishman, Ron Richart, and others, a number of years ago, conducted a whole series of studies that tried to sort out the difference between alert, engaged, and able. And we found out something directly the opposite of this fixation on ability. We found out that the biggest problem that stood in the way of thinking was alertness. Things just passed people by. They didn't notice the little anomalies. They didn't notice that the other side of the case was missing. They didn't notice that the options being considered were narrow and there were other possibilities beyond them. If they noticed, or if this was drawn to their attention, often they cared, they got engaged, but sometimes they didn't. And the least of the problems was the ability itself. People could easily think up answers, think up alternative solutions, or think of arguments on the other side of the case, so forth and so on. The trend of our research was to discover that the big problem in thinking is actually more dispositional than abilities oriented. It has more to do with what people are alert to and care about than it has to do with their basic cognitive capability. But it's not just our research. There's a whole bundle of research in the same direction. One of the simplest versions of it looks at the extent to which people pay attention to the other side of the case when they're thinking of an issue. 
most people don't pay a lot of attention to the other side of the case. They just develop arguments and reasons uh, on their own side of the case. But some people do. Some people are more balanced in their perspective. Interestingly enough, the tendency to pay attention to the other side of the case is not correlated with IQ. Smarter people in the IQ sense, more academically able people, do not pay any more attention to the other side of the case, do not do any more broad perspective taking, are not any more balanced in their thinking than not so gifted people. That's huge. That's huge. So, these five things we've learned, at least, Let's get explicit with our general problem solving. Let's get a control tower. Let's get social. Let's get more situated, but not completely situated. And let's get dispositional about it all. It's not just the general problem solving techniques, strategies, heuristics, organizers. It's the passion, the commitment, the engagement, the alertness, the sensitivity that makes the difference. But. What does that say about the three skeptical stances? Let's go back and look. Back to the skeptics. Number one, IQ and the five things we learned. If I were talking to Arthur Jensen or to Richard Herrnstein, what would I say? And it's very interesting, Richard Herrnstein's role here, because you may recall he was in charge of project intelligence and spent years developing, helping to develop this intervention. And in fact, uh, published with other key figures in the project a well-known paper documenting the impact. But behaviorist to the last, he never really believed it. He was quite dismissive. <laughs> of the whole thing in the end, by the time uh, he helped to write the bell curve, and in particular dismissive of the notion that it had something to do with intelligence with a capital I. What would we say to Richard Herrnstein? Well, one thing we would say is we have some evidence now. <laughs> Look at these studies. He would not be impressed. <laughs> he would accept the evidence, but he would say that the IQ perspective has always allowed that one can get better at particular skills in particular contexts. He would be particularly happy probably with the work on situated learning and say, of course you can get better at historical thinking or scientific thinking. It's just not really general. But the most devastating challenge I think we see here to the IQ tradition comes from number five, the dispositional side of the story. The side of the story that says it's not just what you can do, it's what you lean toward doing. This makes a huge difference in everyday behavior. These leanings tend to be uncorrelated with IQ, a different matter entirely. And they tend to be missed by IQ testing because IQ testing is always on demand. Problems are always posed. An IQ test never asks what you might lean toward doing. It always asks what you can do. But leanings are tremendously important, as Dewey knew, as Israel Scheffler emphasized, and as a large body of research testifies. So if we want a construction, a construct that really talks about what makes people smart, we can't just stop with the ability side of the story. What about situated learning? Well, one thing we learned from situated learning is to get more situated, to get contextual to have richer social structures, to get down into the meaningful moves of the disciplines. But another thing I think we've learned, and I would say this to the situated learning 
enthusiasts, is that the dispositional side of the story is again particularly important because dispositions can be extremely general. Concern for evidence, let's say. Curiosity, let's say. The urge to look at counter theories, different points of view, and so forth. These are powerful moves. They're not powerful moves if you don't know much about the domain. You've got to know something. The situated learning theorists are right. You've got to get into it. But they're powerful framings of what it is to be engaged in the domain. And you will be a better learner, whether it's biology, history, science, or whatever, uh, you know, physics, or whatever, if you have these broad inclinations that help you dig into the particulars of the domain. So, when you take the dispositional side of the story seriously, the problem of generality changes in its character. There's more high leverage generality there than you might think at first. And finally, what would one say to the back to basics people? Well, I think the simplest thing here is to say that it's not either or. You can perfectly well put thinking skills together with serious content learning, with reading, with writing, with arithmetic, and in fact do so at a very early age. By now there are many examples of doing this kind of thing in content contexts with quite young children. So it's not the either or that it's often uh, presented as. Not that I'm all that crazy about back to basics generally, but nonetheless, it's not the either or. If you look at some of the critiques coming from back to basics, they are absolute caricatures of what the teaching of thinking in the context of subject matter learning supposedly looks like. Hardly any resemblance to what you would call good practice. So I think that's the basic, uh, the uh, primary response to back to basics. All right, time to wrap up. <clears throat> back to the future, at last. Where is all this going? Well, hard to say. Hard to say, but here are three things that struck me as particularly important. Revolution, evolution, and what next? First, something familiar to every educator in the room, scaling is a challenge. Let's work on it. The good news is that now, today, the teaching of thinking is much more of a presence on the educational scene than it has often been. It's very much a part, for instance, of the 21st century skills framework that's used here and there around the US. It's very evident in the key competencies framework from the European Union, which gives big emphasis on various kinds of thinking, scientific thinking, digital thinking, and so forth and so on. In a number of state frameworks and other national frameworks, all that's to the good. Moreover, both of these frameworks, the 21st century skills framework and the European Union framework, are highly dispositional in the way they talk about various kinds of thinking. Very much a matter of attitudes and taking opportunities and so forth and so on. All that's to the good, but I'm not sure how much difference it makes in the classroom down the street. We all know about the sluggishness of educational change. And we all, or many of us at least, work on it in many ways. And I don't think the intrinsic problem here is any different than with many other innovations. So enough about that. Here's one that's a little different and kind of interesting. The ways of thinking of the discipline are simple. Let's teach them early. Here's the question I want to put on your mind. What is it to think like a mathematician? What is it to think like a physicist? What is it to think like a historian? What is it to think like a literary critic, an interpreter? These modes of thought are usually viewed as rather sophisticated 
They're the kinds of things you might get to after the basics. They're the kinds of things you might study in high school or university or something like that. Standing, and this is the way they're usually treated. They don't tend to come up much in early education, in elementary school, for instance. But standing back from all this, I've reached a rather different conclusion. These ways of thinking are actually rather easy. They have very simple structures, very simple patterns of evidence, very simple patterns of inquiry. And I have seen teachers work with these kinds of patterns in the fourth grade, in the second grade. It's a shame that we view these as sophisticated because, in fact, the basic rhythm of thinking in the various disciplines is much simpler than a considerable part of the disciplinary content that we teach like, let's say, quadratic equations and factoring or multiple linear equations or all that kind of thing, you can do mathematical thinking with arithmetic perfectly well. You can do scientific thinking with very ordinary phenomena in the world around you with no Newton in sight. Not only that, but these ways of thinking are empowering for learning because they give you a feel for the general game of the discipline. So, rather than put off the pattern and flavor and style of the disciplines, a way forward for me, which is fairly radical, would be to teach them early so that they become learning tools as the learners enter more and more deeply into the disciplines. And the last thing I want to mention today has to do with intuition. Our intuitive minds are both powerful and error prone. So let's develop more artful mental management. Traditionally, the teaching of thinking has been a kind of an abstract analytical kind of thing. It has not paid that much attention to the way our intuitions, the way our perceptions, the way our judgments work. That is very much the tradition. However, over the past decades, a very interesting perspective has emerged on human thought that's called the dual processing perspective. I like to represent it as an iceberg, you know, with the 90% below water. Above the water line, we find our conscious minds. We find deliberation, planning, the planner, and what is sometimes called controlled processing, what we're very aware of. But below the waterline, largely unconscious, we find intuitive thinking. The doing mind that walks across the street and manages it all quite nicely. The doer, automatic processing. We find quick judgments, we find intuitions, we find common sense, we find sizing up people, and all those operations that often very fluently serve us very well. And our actual behavior in real life situations is a kind of a mix of these two minds at work, sometimes deliberate, often rather automatic, but still insightful. And yet, this huge resource of intuitive insight can be a little tricky. For instance, let me give you another problem. Another, this isn't a newspaper article though. It asks for a judgment on what seems to be a very sensible moral question. You ready for a moral question? Okay, here we go. Should a man be allowed to marry his widow's sister? How many think, yeah, sure, that sounds reasonable. <laughs> yeah, I see the hands going on, okay. <laughs> sounds reasonable. Are there any reservations about a man marrying his widow's sister? Uh, what's your reservation about a man marrying his widow's sister? Uh, he's dead. He's dead. <laughs> oh, if he has a widow, he's dead. Still, how liberal are we? I mean, <laughs> I mean, what's the big problem? I'm sure in Egypt, in the olden days, it would probably have been just fine, you know. I, well, 
this is an example of our intuitive minds at work. It sounds plausible. We make quick judgments of plausibility. It sounds right. So we say yes. A huge amount of our cognitive processing is like that. And most of the time it serves us very well. What we have to worry about is the 10% of the time, the 5% of the time, when it doesn't. Here is the downside of the intuitive mind. Hasty thinking, when we just don't notice the funny thing going on about those widows. Stereotyping and bias, defensive routines, addictive patterns, various mistaken patterns of reasoning. For instance, if you happen to know about these things, sunk costs, uh, vividness, where we overweight the weight of vivid evidence, and a bunch of other things. Uh, psychologists make an industry about detecting these kinds of problems and writing them up and doing dissertations on them and so forth and so on. An interesting thing to me about the movement to teach thinking is it's paid hardly any attention to the mischief of the intuitive mind or the resources of the intuitive mind and how to manage the mischief and the resources. And I think that would be a very exciting thing for, uh, for us to look at in the years to come and get some traction on. So that's my effort here to look ahead a bit, not just revolution, our fervor at the beginning, not just evolution, but what next. I'm sure there are other candidates for what next, but I think that's about it for today. I'm way out of time, <laughs> and I thank you for your attention. We really are out of time. I don't know whether we want to try to do the question thing at all. I'm not sure who the MC is for this or what. What's, what's the protocol? I think we are out of time. OK. Thank you for a wonderful talk. And some of us will be taking conversations now. And others of us, in the years to come, want to serve as a sister. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you all. I look forward to seeing you round and about. <laughs>